All right. We're going to go ahead and get going with our second presentation. So I'd like to uh, read you a couple things and introduce you to Roland Pankwich. Roland Pankwich is the CEO of Health Optimization Practice. He lives in Toronto, Canada, where he is also opening the country's first HOPE clinic this year. His background in clinical nutrition and functional medicine give him a wide scope of theoretical understanding on the topics of biochemistry, as well as practical applications to client care. In addition to working with health-focused clients and athletes, Roland consults for health companies as an educator and content creator to support clinical practitioners all over the country, while also maintaining his role as owner-operator of RIPE, that's R-A-P-E, Nutrition, a Canadian-based organic food company. And he, his presentation is on eating gut health and metabolic endotoxemia. Please welcome Roland Pankritz. We good there? Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. It's, uh, it's always hard to follow up Ted, especially listening to his introduction. So I want to start by first and foremost saying I am Canadian. I hope that's OK. <laughs> and I can go real Canadian on you, don't you know? <laughs> it's going to be made of snow, so it'll melt in the spring. It'll be fine, <laughs> fine. So I hope there's some room in your brains left. This originally was three separate topics that I have amalgamated into one. So it starts with eating. Everyone does that here, I hope. That's the fun part. We talk about some stuff that is very relevant to the West Coast. It's organic food. Then we're going to talk about gut health. Who has been diving into gut health here of the last little while? OK, my theory, and I, this is going to confirm it. Doesn't matter how old you are, everyone likes talking about poo and farts and all that stuff. They laugh. We're never too old. And the last part is going to be something called metabolic endotoxemia. It's somewhat of a, a higher level topic, but it's going to be the connection to what happens when the digestive system breaks down and how something that's in our gut can affect our systems peripherally. So I do want to thank the wonderful dinner we had before. I actually have a photo of it. Um, <laughs> now, it's ketogenic for those who are here. So it's fine. There's no carbs. You can totally eat it. So <laughs> but I'm going to start with a quick question. Why do we eat? Why do humans eat? Tastes good, obviously. There's a lot of benefits that come from eating something that's home cooked food and company, but fundamentally we eat to create a symbiotic relationship with plants and other things on this planet. Humans need the electrons that are in food, we also need the oxygen in the environment, and we return the carbon dioxide back to the plants, and we can create water that then helps to fertilize and grow those plants. So if this is the basic fundamentals of why we eat, then the topic of the food choices, the kinds of selections we make, are very important. The fact that we're still arguing over this topic nowadays actually surprises me. Who here does mostly organic stuff? OK. Pop quiz. Before 1950, did anyone know what organic farming was called? Farming. Farming. Yes, I know. <laughs> exactly. The last lecture I gave with this topic, we had a doctor who was 94 still practicing. And I made that joke. And it kind of flew over everyone's head. But he got it because he understood what it was like to work the farm when he was much younger. So the question is, can eating organic food reduce your risk of cancer? Well, the answer pretty much is yes. Association, this is a very recent study. It's actually from last year, 2018. Positive findings, the correlation of eating organic food can actually lower the occurrences of cancer. And that could be from a variety of reasons. It could be, the, again, the toxins that Ted elaborated on. There are more environmental toxins that are being dumped into our environment every day, year after year. And what do our bodies have to do with those? They have to process them somehow. And has anyone ever heard of something called the barrel effect before? So you have a five pound barrel, right? You keep filling it with stuff. And over a period of time, when that barrel starts to overflow, what do we see? We see the initiations of symptoms. Symptoms can be caused by a variety of reasons. And they overflow or overspill into a disease. So we see a lot of people having a large effect of filling their barrel based upon the kind of foods that you eat, be it sprayed crops, GMO. Because the fundamental important aspect when it comes to eating is where does your food come from? Who here buys their stuff directly from a farmer's market, perchance? I'm going to ask maybe three people. Why do you do that, sir? I do it because it's a good must be Well, we're going to talk to you. Absolutely. Yes, why do you do it, sir? It's the most convenient place to get organic raw milk. Exactly, or organic raw milk, which is illegal where I come from. It's grown locally. It hasn't had to be shipped across the country. So it's grown locally, which means it's in season. And when something's in season, what do you think happens to the nutritional status of that food? 
it's as optimal as it can be. If I'm in Canada and I'm in the, it's the summertime, if an apple says South Africa on it, how long before that apple got to me do you think it was picked from the tree? Month. Could be, right? We have a client, uh, Ted and I share uh, client practice in Manila, and I bit into an apple, and I wanted a green apple. He looks at me, he's like, you know that apple could be a year old, right? And I just went, Phew, and just threw it right in the garbage. Because <laughs> that's what it can be. You can pick a fruit that's non-organically grown, that's artificially ripened, and there's no nutritional properties to those foods. What's the most fundamental, fundamentally important aspect of food quality? What matters most? Freshness. Go a little deeper. The environment. Soil, the environment to which it's grown in, right? So if our soil is depleted of nutrients, if the crops aren't properly rotated or, or the fields are not cared for, if the responsibility of the farmer for raising livestock isn't properly attended to, the toxins and the runoff, and lastly, the quality of the water, these things all essentially amalgamate to contribute to the either the benefit and the health promoting aspects of what the food is grown in, or the opposite side where we're getting contaminants. This is a very interesting infographic. I love these things. To me, this is art. And it all stems back to one thing. Soil degradation is essentially at the mercy of all things, be it economics, food population habits. We're over 8 billion now. By 2150, they're saying could be 10 billion people on this planet. We were never designed to feed that many. Environmental impacts and, of course, productivity. Because do humans like waiting for things? Do we want what we want the minute we want it, how we want it? Of course, I want to be able to go to the grocery store and get something that's grown in South America year round. So if we want to do that, then we have to sacrifice the quality of what we're actually growing. I don't need to spend too much time on this, but everyone here knows the detriments of conventional farming, right? What is the purpose of conventional farming? It's to yield industry. It's unfortunately for big profits. And what are the most popular conventional grown crops out there? It's corn, soy, wheat, um, or as I like to say, the sponsored guides of the health guide of, or what is it, the, uh, the Canadian Health Food Guide. It's like it's sponsored by the dairy and wheat farmers of Canada. And what are the two most popular items? Dairy and grains. So you see those kinds of things. When it comes to conventional farming, you see the issues. L lack of crop rotation. So certain crops will pull certain minerals out of the soil at a, a higher rate. So you're going to have deficiencies within the soil. You have pesticides, herbicides, fungicides. I'm going to talk about one of those after. Uh, you have artificial fertilizers. I flew in yesterday and I was watching a documentary about how humans have become far and above the most impactful thing that is altering planet Earth. And the amount of nitrogen concentration increased in the last 20 years is something like 150% in the soil. And that's around the world because, true or false, conventional farms can affect the health and well-being of an organic farm somewhat close to it in proximity. True, so we're seeing alterations in the base of nutrients or elements in the soil. Then we have the soil ecosystem itself. Uh, Dr. Ted mentioned the gut microbiome and the microbiota. Does anyone know that the soil in and of itself has a network system of microbes and fungus and things that interact? So if that breaks down, that's also going to break down the integrity of the soil. Then we have GMO crops. Anyone want the, <laughs> the genes of a fish in a tomato to make sure the tomato doesn't die of permafrost? You do? Okay, let's see. Let's see what happens. Let's keep 50 years longitudinal study, right? Because they haven't been around all that long. Then there's chemically enhanced animals. So recumbent bo bovine growth hormone, or the one that allows the cows to overproduce milk. They become a factory. And it all yields the one thing. It's industry pressure for crop yield. If you look at the size of some of these conventional farms, they're just machines turning things over and over. I won't go through this, but organic farming is very different, or farming as we used to call it back in the 1950s. This is from the Canadian Organic Standards Council. These are back in 2006 in terms of the specific details. Now the difference with organic farming is it's not that we don't spray, I shouldn't say weed. It's not that they don't spray, it's not that there's no per, uh, fertilizers or pesticides or any kind of um, pest control used. It's that they can't be derived from specific uh, pharmaceutical or chemical origins. The crops have to be rotated properly. For example, if you have a farm that was once conventional, you have to let the land sit for up to seven years before you can start farming organically so the land can basically reset itself. And that's a good life cycle aspect, given the understanding that we can't push nature faster than nature wants to move. It's like the idea of disease. How fast can you change the internal health status of someone's body? As fast as their body will let you, given that you've put in all the right signals. My favorite aspect of farming is biodynamic farming. That didn't quite fit. Anyone here familiar with biodynamic farming? 
the idea of everything sustaining itself, the, the water runoff going back to actually allow for the hydration of the soil, the animals and the plants working together. The biodynamic farming is, um, in my opinion, the way to go, but it's never going to be something that will be accepted on a large scale because finances unfortunately run this part. But what I do like to see is people are, are farming for uh, a hobby now. You're seeing biodynamic farms pop up or even urban farms where people are trying to increase their social responsibility based upon the practices they're engaging. The thing that we, my favorite reason for not engaging in eating non-organic food is this stuff right here. Anyone not familiar with glyphosate? Okay, good. And uh, there's something I'm going to show next that's a little shocking. So for those who don't know exactly what glyphosate is, it's a pesticide, herbicide, fungicide. It's essentially a weapons grade antifungal, anti-pest control. It's so strong that they have to engineer plants to be Roundup ready meaning that the herbicide won't actually destroy the very crop they're trying to protect. These three graphs are aspects of autism, celiac incidents, which someone measured before, and then obesity based upon the amount of glyphosate used since its introduction. Those are almost perfect overlays. If you look at the distribution across the US, 1994, look at that little West Coast state right there. I don't know if anyone knows what that is, California. It's actually it hasn't changed that much. So the concentrations in California have actually stayed quite similar to when it was introduced. It's actually grown in the Midwest and the central part of the US because that's where some of the large wheat crops are being grown. Same with corn. And some of the stats there are kind of crazy. The one that scares me is the US contributes to 72% of the global glyphosate yield. One country, the global glyphosate yield. If you go back to the previous slide, uh, what are the countries that have outlawed it? There is, uh, do, 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 do. oh, I had one before. There were 13 countries as of 2017, most of them in Europe, that have outla outlawed the use of glyphosate in any aspect of farming. So the question I have is if a country is going to outlaw it because they've said it is a possible, which it is, a carcinogen, then why is the world not doing the same thing? It's an important question. It's for money. So I always say vote with your dollars. So then you look at food and farms and where it's grown, and how do you know your food is nutritious? Do we follow the food guide or the food labels on the back of a package or something? Who does that? Who's a, who's a label reader here? And it's a good thing to do, they but it's... You make it eight points, so you can't freaking read it. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be smaller and smaller, and that indicates a vitamin A deficiency if you have issues with eyesight. <laughs> All, another reason to do health optimization testing. Oh, exactly, and you don't know, right? And you know, the values that we use for the, assu the assumptions, if you go on nutritiondata.com or some of the uh, online resources, is you get what's called the RDA rating, which was established in the 40s, and the values that they use are still from that time period, meaning that the RDA was established when the world was a very different place. And the RDA does what? It gives you guidelines for healthy individuals to not allow themselves to develop nutritional deficiencies. And another way of saying it, it's the smallest amount of that nutrient you need not to develop a disease. Is it optimal? No, not at all. Because if you look at some of the aspects of crops then and crops now, spinach and collards, which are leafy greens, these are the crops that have had the biggest hit in terms of the nutritional density. So what you now eat in terms of spinach, you might need eight times the quantity of spinach just to get your recommended amount of vitamin C versus a few years ago. Now, I don't recommend eating corn, but you can see even corn's taken a hit, but certain nutrients actually have gone up based upon the fact that artificial fertilizers will enhance the production of certain vitamins and minerals and depress the, the production of others. The ones that are typically most compromised are the ones that are the trace minerals, things that we don't often think about. Things like selenium, uh, strontonium, boron, very small, minute amounts, but those things are needed to optimize the intracellular function of every organ in our body. Then we go to cooking methods. So I'm sure everyone here does something called, you know, boiling, high heat cooking, things like that. The aspect of the food that gets most compromised is when it's either introduced to a change in pH, so acidification or basification, or it's frozen, or it's heated in specific quantities. What happens to the color of the water when you boil vegetables? And what do most people do with that water? And none of me, most people don't drink it, they throw it out. They should use it for soup. Those are actual nutrients leaching into the food, or leaching into the water, rather. 
So the food itself is actually devoiding, devoiding the very nutrients that we're trying to get by eating well. So if you look at all these different aspects, especially plants and oils, heat extraction or chemical extraction, all the native nutrients of those plants or oils are being lost via processing. And this is a pretty scary slide. So if I have to put a hazmat suit on to go out into a field to spray a crop, I don't want what's coming out of there. Oh good, it's a free range chicken. It can move its neck side to side. I guarantee you if that cow sneezed, there would be an explosion and milk would fly everywhere. And then there's the aspect of how you overly ripen bananas. So we don't like to see brown spots on our bananas. Humans don't like things that aren't perfect and discolored. So there's a chemical way you can ripen a banana to make it look perfect so it's very visually appealing so we'll go to the grocery store and we'll buy it. And if people aren't educated, they think that's what an optimal banana looks like. <sighs> then there's chicken. It takes 56 days now to mature a chicken. Not even two months, you can get a full chicken. This big, juicy, now I don't know what it tastes like, but this is only within the last, what, 1957 to 2005. It's not a very long period of time for us to totally change the landscape of the food, the produce, the animal proteins that we're being exposed to. And as a result of that, we need to think about how food is affecting us, not only on a, a personal scale, but also on a geographic scale, right? Because we need to take care of the planet. It's important final perspectives there. The main goal of eating is to provide your body with optimal building blocks to maintain health. And just as Dr. Ted said, just because you're not sick, it doesn't mean you're healthy. It just means that you're not sick. We should optimize our nutritional return on investment. I do a lot of client work, and one thing I t teach my clients, and this is something that I hopefully you'll be able to give to all of you today, is the nutrient to calorie ratio. Everyone's obsessed with calories, how much carbohydrate I eat, how much protein, how much fat. Well, how much vitamin A do you eat every day? How much selenium, how much vitamin K do you get? So for every calorie of food you put in your body, you should try to maximize the amount of nutritional return on investment from a micronutrient perspective. We should select food that allows for the maintenance of the soil ecosystem, and thus our environment. And the most important thing that you can do as a consumer, as an individual, is you can vote with your purchasing power or your purchasing habits. I like that everyone in California does the farmer's market thing, or people will go out of their way to find this information because it's teaching this not only to your peers, but to the next generation and the generations that come after that essentially change the, the habits of how people look at food and relate to food. Within the aspect of food in and of itself, we have to now shift gears to where we're gonna process most of our food. So I'm gonna move to the gut health section. So before I go into gut health, does everyone, anyone have any specific questions about digestive health that I could maybe tie in? There was something about celiac I heard before, or any specific topics that they want to make sure are addressed in some way, shape, or form? Crohn's and colitis. Crohn's and colitis, okay, we can definitely touch on that. So mostly bowel diseases, okay. Well, if this is you, you've come to the right place. <laughs> Never trust half-price sushi. But some people market this very effectively, it's called a cleanse, and they assume that you're cleansing your tissue if you blow everything out of your backside. <laughs> Digestive health has become one of my you know, special areas. It's something that I'm investing a lot of time in right now, building the course for the health optimization program. And I would be remiss to talk about digestion and digestive issues because these are some scary stats for the American populations here. So 20% of Americans have acid reflux disease. These are new stats. These are the newest I could find as of 2017. Uh, 25 million or greater have gallstones. One in, 30, one in 133 are celiac. However, 83% of those potentially have been misdiagnosed. Or 83% of people who think they have celiac and have told they have something else are potentially misdiagnosed. What do you, we have Crohn's. As many as 780,000 Americans suffer from Crohn's. Ulcerative colitis is actually winning, unfortunately, at 907,000. IBS potentially affects more people than the entire population of Canada in the US. And IBS is a functional motility disorder that takes on many different forms for many different people. And lastly, 75% of Americans age 45 and older have hemorrhoids. And I hope no one starts shifting in their chair here, because that's an awkward realization. <laughs> so that's, a, that's as of 2017. It's likely not getting any better. So these are the questions that I have. You know, why do so many people suffer with these issues? How do they develop? Do you think any two diseases, like Crohn's or colitis, are the exact same pr process of development for two people? 
This is a very complex mix. Uh, how do we prevent this as a pathology? Because pathology is an end stage. And the last thing is, what does one need to know in terms of specifics? What I'm going to go into is generalized information. So I want to make it very clear that I'm not trying to treat anyone because, as Dr. Ted said, we don't treat disease, number one. And number two, they, they are pieces of information that are valuable as general knowledge, but testing is really the best way to go when you want to get specific details regarding yourself. Many people in the health and wellness industry don't even go deep enough, in my opinion, when it comes to clinical practice and understanding what it is they need to know with digestion. So this is what most health professionals know, and to a degree, a large part of the general population. You know, the stomach is the principal site of protein digestion. You absorb most of your nutrients in the small intestine. You process most of your waste in the colon. You also reabsorb some fiber, and you have the bacteria that ferment and break down the very foods that you eat. The pancreas, you secrete all of your enzymes, your bicarbonate to help neutralize the acid coming out of your stomach. And lastly, the gallbladder, you make this thing called bile. It concentrates bile. It helps you emulsify fat so food doesn't run through you like a Japanese bullet train. <laughs> However, if you want to go one level deeper, there are specialized functions that each organ has. For example, who here has experienced food poisoning? That's fun, isn't it? No, you're clutching the bathroom saying, never again will I eat that if you just make this stop. So if you eat food that has a bacterial pathogen on it, and your stomach can't make strong enough stomach acid, does that bacterial pathogen have the ability to potentially hitch a ride into your digestive system? Absolutely. So the function of your stomach is very important more for than just protein digestion. The small intestine. The small intestine is actually the principal site of our immune system. We have 70% of our immune cells roughly residing in the small intestine, and it's the education between the food that comes in, the body's ability to say this is food, so this is tolerated, versus that's a pathogen, this thing's a, an enemy. That's what we need to do in, to in order to make sure that we don't develop a large host of food allergies, which we were talking about at dinner. If you look at the colon, the colon has a very strong connection to the metabolic system. The kind of bacteria that reside in your digestive system, for example, can either predict uh, potential aspects of future weight gain or the development of neurodegenerative diseases, because there's a gut-brain axis just like there's a gut-immune axis. If we look at the pancreas, if we don't have proper secretion of bicarbonate or enzymes, we don't digest our food properly, which alters the pH inside the small intestine, which can lead to the degradation of tissues. And lastly, with the gallbladder, the gallbladder secretes bile, as I mentioned before, but this bile acts as like a soap, so it prevents this phenomenon called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So again, if these things aren't functioning optimally, we could be predisposing ourselves to a not-so-great condition. And question for anyone here, if one of these things is thrown off, does that potentially lead to a compromised state of the function of the entire system? Yes. Always. It's, it's a network. So if you look at how foods are digested, so in the mouth, dietary carbohydrates are actually necessary to mix with your saliva. That helps you break down the, the bonds between the starches and the carbohydrates. But from a protein and a fat perspective, not so much. We want to make sure that we're chewing properly because my teacher in uh, my nutrition school always said, your stomach doesn't have teeth because I used to inhale my food. It's bad. I've been told that I need to slow down. You look at the small intestine, again, oh, sorry, the stomach rather, when you get to the stomach, there's no carbohydrate digestion happening anymore, but that's the principal site of where the proteins start to become denatured. So they essentially go from a complex structure to more simple structures so they can be acted upon by the enzymes in the small intestine. That's where most of the major digestion happens for all three macronutrients. And as you get further towards the actual digestive layer where they're transported across, if this process isn't seamless, then we have something called malabsorption or maldigestion. And an easy way to look at that is when you go to the washroom, and this is where humans have their little thing with poo, I say make sure you look at what's coming out of you. Because if you see undigested food in your stool, what does that potentially mean? Chew better. A bit chew better, but you're not digesting and absorbing optimally, right? I always talk to, this, to my clients about the idea of peristalsis. And I give them something called the beet test or the radio tracer challenge. I say, swallow a tablespoon of sesame seeds or eat beets, hit the timer, and let me know when you see red or when you see something come out. The average transit time for a healthy individual should be somewhere between 16 or 18 to 24 hours. And the average transit time for a North American can go up to 72. And unfortunately, women seem to be more affected than men. 72 hours. So once every three days, someone might actually release some waste. And waste isn't just food that needs to be removed from your body. That's also things that have been bound, toxins that have conjugated themselves, and the body has created this ability to remove it. 
Now, the colon has a blood supply, it's vascularized. So what actually is in that stool can get reabsorbed into the bloodstream. And the body has to deal with the, to the toxification over and over again. So you can see how the toxic load can build up via the barrel effect. So from a digestive aspect, these are the final perspectives I want to share with you. It should be symptom free. If you have something like heartburn, bloating, indigestion, uh, any of those aspects that are chronic, you know that there's a problem that must be addressed. It should happen autonomously. You should not know where the food is in your digestive system. That can give you an insight as to where the imbalance might be, but you shouldn't know necessarily. You should be able to eat, have it come out, go for it to your next meal or go about your next day. The system should move regularly, as I mentioned, and it should integrate seamlessly. What I mean by that is from the start of chewing to the evacuation, the, it's, meant to work as a, it's meant to be worked as a network. So if you have issues along the way, that's why I always suggest to my clients, test what's coming out because it gives you some insights as to how that actual system is working. It should not be hard to release your waste. The same should be said, it shouldn't come out of you too quickly. So constipation or having a loose stool or diarrhea, that's an imbalance, that's a problem because things are either being in there too long or they're coming out too quickly. And lastly, as I said, there should be no evidence of what you ate. Much of this comes from the food choices you make, and if your digestion is not optimal, it should never be left alone because the resulting effects can multiply. And that brings us into gut health. This is a really good graphic. Why I like this graphic is, if I were a pathogen, I would want to see, sorry, I wouldn't want to see a really well-formed colony because it would make my life a lot harder. It would make the fight to establish a residence in the digestive system much harder. Think of the inside of your body like an ecosystem in and of itself. So you have a tube, and inside that tube you have a digestive layer of cells. Those cells are what do the absorbing, and they also help regulate the immune activity down there. Over top of those cells you have some mucus, and you have a physical barrier that protects and separates the bacteria that live in your gut from the cells of your digestive system. And everything will affect everything else, so it truly is an ecosystem. These are some interesting insights to the GI system. So if you took it, flattened it out, it would be essentially the size of two tennis courts. That's how large your absorptive area is. Does anyone know why the body has done that? To give you the maximal chance to do so. That's how important it is for sustaining life. Without nutrition, the body starts to wither away and die. As I mentioned, your GI system does contain about 70% of your body's immune system. And you potentially have more microbes than they do cells in your body. The reason I say potentially is we've waffled back and forth in the research in the last few years. We used to say we have 10 times the amount of bacteria than we do cells in the body. Then we said, no, we have four times. Now it's somewhere about 1.3, 1.4 to 1, Ted, if that's what the most recent science says. It's pretty close. So it's almost one to one. And as a result of that, the microbes communicate both with each other and they communicate with the rest of the system. They can modify your DNA epigenetically, as mentioned in the previous lecture. You have a separate nervous system in your, in your gut. It's called your enteric nervous system. So if anyone ever gets nervous and gets butterflies in their stomach, that's an interaction or a physical response of how those two things communicate. You also have many neurotransmitters in the gut, and these are used as communication molecules. And if I go back to my glyphosate uh, example from the food section, it said that glyphosate is safe for human consumption because it may be potentially carcinogenic, but it hasn't been shown to be um, absolutely detrimental to human health. But it does prevent the overgrowth of pathogens and microbes. So if it doesn't necessarily affect our cells, do you think it might affect the microbes in our GI system? What it does functionally is it inhibits the pathway that those bacteria make the neurochemicals and neuro neurotransmitters that they use for communication. So it disrupts that ability for your body to take an amino acid, or the, the bacteria rather, to take an amino acid and chemically modify it so it can send a signal back and forth to the immune system. So if we do that for years and years and we're looking at things like chronic obesity, celiac disease, autism, do they all have an immune and a neurological connection or a metabolic connection? Absolutely. And the last thing is every decision you make surrounding food will contribute to the chaos or the harmony in your gut. Dr. Ted mentioned, you can change your gut bacteria profile in as little as 48 hours. So if you're eating the same thing all the time, you're not getting a good diversity of foods, fibers, colorful phytonutrients, you're not contributing to the growth and the proliferation of healthy and diverse gut bacteria. So looking at the microbiome, 
in and of itself, it's actually a complex bidirectional pathway. What I mean by bidirectional is the bacteria talk to the, the actual GI system and the GI system will communicate to the bacteria because they work as a team to help optimize the ability to extract nutrients from food and regulate the overall health of your body. The immune system must adapt and tolerate to the gut microbiota composition. Every person has a very unique print. It's kind of like a thumbprint. Is there a perfect thumbprint out there? So there's not technically a perfect microbiome, but there is one that is either more health promoting or more disease promoting for that individual. You have to maintain a vigilance over pathogens. Certain bacteria like E. coli, um, e. coli uh, some of the very potentially problematic ones that you can pick up when you're traveling, those are called pathogens or opportunists. If you have a good, healthy gut microbiome, you're more resistant to these infections becoming a big problem, whereas if you have a very weak microbiome, they can burrow in and affect the, the overall health status of the cells in the immune system. The last thing is the microbes play an important role for educating the immune system. When it comes to childbirth, what's a healthier option, natural birth or C-section? Does anyone know why? <coughs> so when the baby goes to the birth canal, it inoculates with mom's bacteria. I call that your probiotic starter kit when you come into this world. And that's the bacteria that the immune system is expecting to communicate back and forth with. However, if you have a child that's born C-section, where do they get their first exposure of bacteria from? whoever's hands or skin they contact first, right? And I've tested a lot of clients in the last even three, four months. I've probably done about 15 to 20 different digestive tests. What I see is people who are born C-section have a more uh, similar bacteria profile to the skin inside of their gut or their, their stool than someone who's born naturally. These people also have higher occurrences of asthma, more propensity for autoimmune diseases, and metabolically they don't seem quite as healthy. And the influence on the microbiome and the microbiota itself is multifactorial. You can do it via diet, you can do it via the endocrine system, so stress can modulate your gut bacteria for worse or for better. Geographical environment, so if you travel a lot, your microbiome is always changing. Ted and I know that all too well. Uh, jet lag, bacteria do beget jet lag, so if you do travel, give yourself some time to adjust. It's about one day per hour of time change. Uh, overall digestive health. As I mentioned before, if your digestive secretions are lacking, then that's going to overall impact the gut microbiome. And if someone's been on antibiotics, one course of antibiotics can cause up to six months of time before your bacteria rebounds, and it's never quite the same. So if someone's had multiple courses of antibiotics, or they're on proton pump inhibitors, or they're on antacids, or they're on some kind of functional motility medication, that changes everything. This is a cool slide. Most people think that the bacteria is very uniformly distributed. In the stomach, you actually have a high species of H. pylori and lactobacillus. At the World Microbiota Conference this year, I was having dinner with a gentleman, and he, we were talking about this, and he said, most people have H. pylori, they think it's something that needs to be eradicated. The problem is people are actually being born with a lactobacillus deficiency, so the H. pylori is proliferating, and it's causing issues with um, esophageal tissue growing out of the stomach into the actual esophagus. So they're getting chronic hernias and chronic GERD based upon the fact that there's a bacterial imbalance in that specific organ. The further you go down the tube, when you get to the colon, you have an exponentially higher amount of bacteria in the colon, which is why so much of the metabolic activity goes on there. So when people have things like colitis or Crohn's, a lot of the flare-ups are in the colon because that's where the gut immune system has the, the largest amount of interaction with the bacteria themselves. When you're born, you're born almost sterile. They're finding that there is bacteria present in the placenta, but when you're born, for the lack of better description, you're a blank canvas. And your microbiome will gradually grow till about the age of three where it adopts a more finalized profile. And then the aspects on the left-hand side can influence not only that basic profile, but the variables in which it develops over the course of time. So if your mother had a healthy gut bacteria, you have a better chance. If you're breastfed versus formula fed, you're going to have a more diverse microbiome because there are fibers in breast milk that can actually optimize the growth and development of specific bacteria in the profile. Uh, if you're overly sanitary, if you're washed down with hand sanitizer all the time, that matters because what the kids do, especially babies when they're learning with, about the world, they, touch something and they put their hands in their mouth, they lick the dog, or they'll grab dirt and they'll eat it, that's a way of introducing microbes into your system. So if you disrupt that natural process before the age of three, it might negatively impact the, uh, the overall potential health of someone's gut as they get older. Because what happens is something called dysbiosis. 
Dysbiosis is a state to which the gut bacteria profile is to a degree unhealthy, and there's a large a, a range or a variety of how healthy or unhealthy it can be, but essentially it's an imbalance of the commensal bacteria, the ones that are natively supposed to be there, versus the pathogenic bacteria, and it can greatly disrupt the crosstalk between the immune system. Any aspect of dysbiosis can drive inflammatory processes, and inflammation is what we're trying to avoid when it comes to optimizing health. So it increases the presence of harmful bacterial metabolites. Uh, it can break down the physical and chemical barriers that the gut wants to maintain in order to maintain its health status. It can initiate something called leaky gut or gut permeability, which is where things inside the digestive system can get into the bloodstream because the barrier is gone. And as a result of that, it can lead to chronic local and systemic inflammation, and the immune system is always the one that has to respond. I like infographics, so I've included a lot of them just to give the visual learners here a chance to get a better picture. On the left-hand side, you see this is a healthy gut. So the small intestine, which has a smaller, bacter a smaller bacterial layer as well as a thin mucosal layer, that's the one that needs to be maintained so the immune system doesn't go haywire. As a result of the breakdown there, we see a lot of issues that drive inflammation because the immune system and the absorbative cells in the small intestine are very important for making sure things come through the cells and not between the barriers. If you look at the colon on the right hand side, the bacterial population in the colon gets much, much higher. And it connects to the final topic which I'm going to be speaking about today called endotoxemia, where there's specific elements of microbes that have a physical structure called a lipopolysaccharide. It's called an endotoxin. And when these endotoxins get through the, the chemical barrier into general circulation, the finding the latest research on correlates with chronic degenerative diseases like heart disease, uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, things of that nature are very much tied to normal bacterial processes getting outside of the tube where they're meant to stay. Because th this is essentially what dysbiosis drives. You have a thinning of the mucosal barrier, so a dysfunction of the ability to separate and segregate what's supposed to be in there and you have an increase in the pathogenic bacteria because they're not only able to grow in populations because of the inflammation that's killing off the good guys to keep them in check, but the lack of barriers also allow them to get outside, as I mentioned, causing this chronic drive of inflammatory processes. So when it comes to the question of what do we do, this is really a, a great way to look at the basis of how to approach it. You have the actual microbiota, which we want to take care of, you have the aspects of permeability which are required for proper segregation and the aspects of mucosal immunology all due to the fact of those internal barriers or internal factors being optimized. The details of which are very unique to the individual but the, the basic takeaway is healthy food, managing, managing stress levels, optimizing your sleep processes, staying active, the things that contribute to a healthy human overall. Because when the barrier breaks down, this is a new area where I'm researching, so I wanted to introduce a lot of this stuff to you. If the barrier breaks down, as I mentioned before, and let's skip forwards, it's unique to each aspect of the digestive system. In the stomach, if the barrier breaks down, we can have an aspect of H. pylori infection or any kind of inflammatory process there. In the small intestine and the colon, we have two different aspects of barrier function. Because we have a relatively smaller amount of bacteria in the small intestine, we only have a single barrier layer that's physical, and then we have a chemical, sorry, a physical holding together of all the tight junctions between our cells. When we have an overgrowth of bacteria in the small intestine because of digestive dysfunction, the actual area gets overly populated with bacteria, and it can cause a leaky or a hyperpermeability of the digestive system because bacteria from the colon start to migrate upwards. If that happens, what it can also lead to is an inflammatory process that ends up thinning or breaking down the microbiome layer in the colon so the bacteria no longer have a place to live and the species become from a diverse to a more sparse uh, ratio or makeup. And what you can do is you can contribute to non-specific digestive dysfunction as a result of having a problem in the stomach, a problem in the small intestine, and a problem in the colon. Because the most important aspect is making sure that what we do from a digestive perspective is we keep the things that are meant to be in the gut, in the gut, and we keep the things that are meant to be in the bloodstream able to be pulled through the cells. And the reason small molecules are, are chronically broken down to smaller and smaller pieces is we're designed to absorb things in that specific manner. What I mean by that is if I take a carbohydrate from a glucose molecule or from a, a long carbohydrate chain molecule, 
uh, we'll call it a sweet potato or an apple, I want to be able to break it down to glucose because that small molecule is able to be pulled through the digestive lining into the bloodstream. If I have a dysfunctional digestive system and I have something like a protein source, if that protein is not broken down into an amino acid, what ends up happening is that improperly digested protein source can get pulled through the barriers. So right between, if you look at the graphic, the barrier of the cell. If that protein source is in the digestive system, the body doesn't recognize what it is. And what it ends up doing is it tells the immune system this is a foreign invader. And if it's chicken, if it's an egg, if it's a dairy protein, the more I eat that food, the more my immune system makes a memory of it. And as a result, it creates an inflammatory response and we have what's called a full-blown food allergy. The more we do this, we can contribute to digestive dysfunction and long-term health complications, which is why I always test food sensitivity panels in all my clients, because the easiest thing to do is remove an allergenic food from your diet, so your body's not always cr chronically trying to deal with the inflammatory process. Because if the tight junctions break down and our gut becomes permeable, it takes time and a, an increased amount of nutrient density in order for our bodies to be able to heal that, because they themselves are complex protein structures. So when it comes to a healthy gut or an inflamed gut, what are the things you want to look for? Well, a healthy gut, as I said, has a thick mucosal layer. It's got a good profile of commensal bacteria, meaning we don't have too many overgrown pathogens. We have a very optimal aspect of immune cell activation, meaning if something comes into our system that's not meant to be there, we can sound the alarm, raise inflammation, and get rid of it. But otherwise, the system is very calm on a regular basis. The ability to absorb nutrients is optimal based upon the fact that the vitamins, the minerals, the antioxidants, the carbs, proteins, and the fats are optimally digested and they're being, di they're being pulled through properly. An in inflamed gut is the exact opposite. So we don't digest food properly. The cells themselves are not able to absorb. The bacteria, the profile is very dysbiotic, it can be very inflamed. And it was, as a result, the immune system is chronically activated and when the immune system gets chronically activated, this is what I always tell people, it's the only system in your body that can either hurt you or heal you. And when it can't distinguish what to do between the two, usually we see symptoms ending in a, some kind of a disease manifestation. So final perspectives are separated basically in this way. These are the three ways I look at it. Separate, mediate, and invigorate. We want to provide an environment that can separate the contents to make sure that our health does not go south based upon what we know to be a healthy gut. From a mediation perspective, we want to make sure that we're rotating the foods we eat on a regular basis. We're supplying the vitamins, the minerals, and the cofactors that our digestive system needs in order to operate properly. And invigorate, that's an important aspect when it comes to what you're eating. What do most North Americans eat on a regular basis? A beige diet. A diet devoid of different colored fruits and vegetables, high in processed carbohydrates, high in toxic fats. As a result of that, not only do we not feed the bacteria, but we start to run a deficiency of what the, the digestive system needs in order to maintain its own health. So we want to invigorate it with high quality organic food, the right kinds of supplements, and when in doubt, always test to see what it is your specific needs are based upon what might be deficient. So from a final perspective, number one, Endure, ensure robust digestion, that's a given. Number two, support gastric mucosal production, making sure that you supply the right amino acids and cofactors for the body to be able to keep that physical barrier intact. Number three, support the health status and energy production of the digestive cells and immune cells. Specific vitamins, specific kinds of fibers are created into something called a short chain fatty acid. These are the very foods that our cells use to ensure the optimal production of energy and ATP. Number four, provides fermentable substrates for the microbiota. The fastest disappearing nutrient in the modern diet is fiber. Does anyone know what the required or suggested amount of fiber should be every day? 36 grams is the optimal number. The reason I asked that question is I know that's, that's Ted's number. Now, <laughs> is fiber fiber? No. What I mean by that is you can't just take 36 grams of Metamucil in water and call it a day. You want to, that would also cause a very, very negative reaction. You want to diversify the kinds of fermentable fibers you're getting. What I tell everyone is go to the grocery store and rotate the different kinds of fruits and vegetables you eat, either based upon color or trying something new on rotation, because the body does like variety. 
allow for dietary practices that support your microbiome ecosystem. As you learn in the microbiome, uh, the worst offenders are high fat, high carb foods at the same time, or what I call the delicious food groups. <laughs> I know, pizza, donuts, cakes, pastries, all those things. Now, while they may taste good, if you chronically expose your system to that, you can perturb the basic makeup of what the microbiome wants to maintain in terms of ba gut bacteria ecology. The last aspect is minimize inflammation, because anything physical, chemical, emotional, or energetic can cause a negative response, and anytime you raise inflammation, you raise the potential for disease. This is what a basic profile of one of our GI tests looks like in health optimization. So we have the four pillars of infection, inflammation, insufficiency, and imbalance. And what we can do is we can dig deeper into each of these categories to figure out where the client's imbalances are specifically as it relates to them. And as a clinician, this is how I determine what I do. I never guess anything. I assess everything and make, as, make an objective as, or as much as possible, an objective-based decision. So I know my client is actually getting what they specifically need, not what I heard the latest news on Dr. Oz might be. <laughs> not to, you know, he's trying to do some good stuff, but again, a lot of it is very surface level information. So when it comes to promoting gut health, what happens or what's an example of something that gets broken down? Now we're going to get into metabolic endotoxemia. So I have a confession to make. This was me before I optimized my gut health. Oh, that's, well that's interesting. Hold on. So that was me. That was me before I met Dr. Ted, I promise you. There's absolutely no embellishment of this story. I was stuck in my house eating burger after burger. No, I'm just, now I'm going on. <laughs> However, the graphic does illustrate something that's quite common. Most people eating this kind of diet typically abuse their metabolism. As a result of abusing their metabolism, their health status becomes compromised. The poorer your health status, the higher this phenomenon of metabolic endotoxemia likely is to happen. So I'm going to try to describe this in basic, simple terms, and if people have further questions, we can elaborate. So endotoxemia is when the phenomenon of a, an internal toxin in your digestive system becoming systemically circulated. And what happens is your body will have a nonspecific inflammatory response. Where that inflammatory response usually happens is where it's being traveled around to. So if it's in the heart, it can be something cardiovascular. If it's in the brain, it can be something neurologic. And you know, if someone experiences a symptom like brain fog or a, a mood change, something after they've eaten they don't feel good, usually it's four to five hours after a meal has taken place. So the condition is characterized by the increase of serum endotoxins. Now lipopolysaccharide is a hard term to remember. There's a guy by the name of Dr. Stephen Gundry, and what he calls them, and I'm going to drop a swear word here, but I'm just going to go for it, he calls them little pieces of shit, LPS. And if you can remember LPS, and you can remember that little dick description, it makes it a lot easier because they act like that inside the body. They're, they're not doing you any favor. Inside the gut, they have a specific role, but not inside the rest of the system. So it's a condition characterized by an increase in endotoxins, measurable in the blood, five hours after a meal, and it's typically, as I mentioned, the high-carb and high-fat foods that have the greatest impact. So this is important to note. If someone is on a specific diet where they're trying to heal their digestive system, Avoiding high-carb, high-fat foods, and this could be avocado toast, it doesn't just have to be pizza or a donut, for example, is one of the better strategies when you want to optimize the postprandial process. So what happens is when the endotoxin serums elevate in concentration, the immune cells will then drive the inflammatory process even more because they want to remove the serum endotoxins from the bloodstream. If this goes on long enough, then chronic endotoxemia can yield chronic inflammation. And if we're talking a day, it's not a big deal. If we're talking a week, it's probably not quite a problem yet, but if we're talking months and years, you can see how the body can start to break down because long-term inflammation causes degeneration. The molecule itself is actually quite simple. It's a lipopolysaccharide, so it's a carbohydrate and fat-based substance. And inside the digestive system, the bacteria actually have them on the outside of their cell wall. And they're used for either adhesion to the inside of the, the bacterial molecules or their um, sensing between, their communication between the bacteria themselves. So it's the problem when they get out of the actual gut and into general circulation, as I mentioned. The technical aspects are the lipopolysaccharide, when it's flowing around in the bloodstream, binds to a binding protein. So this is how the body clears it. 
The binding protein then essentially attaches to a cell receptor and then the inflammatory process is released because an inflammatory molecule can help the immune cells gobble them up. But if this is chronic, meaning it goes on over and over again, the amount of area that's being currently researched, I'm going to skip ahead to this area right here in the sake of time. This is where we're actually seeing the highest amount of research being done and connected to endotoxins and the development of chronic degenerative diseases. So heart disease, issues with triglycerides or lipid problems in the blood would also relate to aspects of uh, insulin resistance and potentially diabetes. Hypertension, dementia, cancer, for women, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and the development of non-alcoholic fatty liver syndrome. For example, if someone is struggling with excessive obesity, then the floating endotoxins themselves can actually drive changes in fat cells. So you can actually cause a fat cell to oversecrete things like insulin and inflammatory compounds when the body's always secreting these things into the bloodstream. And this characterizes it very well. In combination with modern lifestyle factors, the increase in bacterial and bacterial endotoxin translocation arising from a more permeable intestinal wall, so digestive dysfunction, hyperpermeability, causing low-grade inflammation state. We support this hypothesis with a numerous study finding associations <clears throat> and markers of endotoxemia suggesting that this process plays a pivotal and perhaps even causal role in the development of low-grade inflammation and its related diseases. So if we know that this all stems from improper digestion, compromised gut health, what do you want to do to optimize it? Well, if you remember that what you eat directly affects your gut, and as a result of it affecting your gut health, it directly affects your endotoxin status. And increasing levels of endotoxin will directly affect your health status. So I hope you now see That's a big one. Jurassic Park is always a classic reference. So thank you very much. I'm going to end on that note right there. Yeah, questions? One back here. So earlier, you had a slide a show of a child when, if they grow up with a pet or not, uh, not growing up with a pet. Mm -hmm. Is there any difference? So growing up with a pet, typically you, you develop a more diverse bacterial exposure because animals themselves have a very unique bacterial makeup. So if a child grows up with a pet, uh, at a young age it can help stimulate the development of their immune system because it changes the kinds of bacteria that reside in the digestive system and it may result in a healthier child because they're more exposed to a variety of different strains of bacteria. Oh, there's a part two to that. Okay, <laughs> we'll follow up here. So, so that means uh, a child grow up with a pet, they will be more, they will be healthier than potentially. The child? It's potentially yes, because um, at a young age, if you're exposed to more diverse immune stimulus, and the immune stimulus could be a little bit, bit of a mild stress, it creates a more robust immune response. So the body's better able to deal with inflammatory uh, signals, or uh, it allows for the development of a more tolerant immune system. So a lower chance of allergies and things like that. So, um, in regards to obesity, mm -hmm. um, the big thing now is for people to be obese, they recommend a ketogenic diet. Yes. But according to what you are saying, this is really not a good thing to uh, do. No, because the ketogenic oh. is a low-carb, high-fat diet. Right. High-fat? So, it's high-fat, high-carb that seems to be the greatest stimulant. Or the combination. The combination at mm -hmm. the same time. Uh, if you have a very, very poor digestive system, I have had some clients where the ketogenic diet, at first they don't feel good. It's because they go into the ketogenic diet without the requisite support for the digestive system. So they don't have any enzymes, they don't have the proper bacteria, they don't have the support that allows the benefits of the ketogenic diet because the gut itself isn't in a good state to digest those fats. If as a clinician you take care of those variables first and you make sure that the ketogenic diet is well structured, what I mean by well structured is not just bacon, butter and meat but you're having high fiber, low carbohydrate vegetables from a variety of sources, the bacteria still need food. So it's how you structure the ketogenic diet. But you're, you're right in saying from an obesity perspective, it's probably one of the best interventions you can do from a diet perspective. Good. Uh, what do you think is fasting's effect? And specifically, 
do you think that fasting actually preferentially eliminates the more pathological parts of your microbiota? Uh, from everything I've read, what fasting does is it gives the, the immune system a large reset. So anything that's highly inflamed as a result of what's coming in, that internal stimulus or that incoming stimulus gets silenced when you fast. I've seen researchers say that it increases microbiome activity. When you fast, the bacteria don't have food coming in, so they turn to the mucosal layer, which is rich in carbohydrates and fibers, for their source of food. So providing you have a healthy digestive system and you fast, that's going to be secreted on a regular basis. Your uh, gut mucosal barrier gets resecreted almost every hour. So if you have healthy internal processes, fasting actually increases micro microbiome diversity because food from an external source isn't influencing it negatively. Uh, to say the aspects of improving immune function and gut function from fasting, yes, I think the best benefit is because it reduces the inflammatory response. Um, i just like to uh, say that metabolic endotoxemia actually occurs in all of us, but it's at a very low level. What I'd like to uh, broadly explain is that you know what LDLs are, right? You've taken your blood tests, and I would like you to explain to them the role of LDLs in the clearance of uh, the endotoxins. Ah, that's a good point. Uh, we were talking about cholesterol at dinner very briefly. Um, most people look at cholesterol as a marker of just overall metabolic health and triglyceride lipid levels. If you have increased amounts of lipopolysaccharides getting into the bloodstream, the fastest way that the body can help clear them up besides the immune cell secreting cytokines are increasing uh, LDL and HDL levels because they act as vesicles or transport vesicles. So when we see someone who has a high LDL or a high HDL and the pattern doesn't fit with high triglycerides and high fasting glucose levels, that could be a sign of them having excessive lipopolysaccharide release into the bloodstream because the body's just trying to mop up the lipopolysaccharides for lack of better description. So, you know, the, the medical system might say, oh, cholesterol's high, let's give you a statin. But the actual decision that needs to be made there is you might have a leaky gut. We need to actually take care of the barrier and the integrity of, of your digestive health. And if you do that and the LDL and the HDL levels return to a more normal level, you know that it was actually a response to internal endotoxin levels. It wasn't a lipid problem in the first place. Very good. More questions? Oh, one more. I'm a big fan of um, meat stock, which is a very healing kind of soup. is more easily digested and, and more soothing to the gut mm -hmm. than bone broth. Um, but I'm not 100% clear on why and how it has such a beneficial effect. I'm, I'm wondering if you can talk to that. Uh, from a a composition perspective, typically things like broths and soups and, and foods of those natures, they're high in two specific amino acids. One is glycine, the other is proline. Uh, if you look at the tight junction molecules, they're composed of about 40 different specialized proteins. The amino acids that are the highest are uh, glycine and proline. So most people nowadays when they eat muscle meat are deficient in those amino acids because they come from the more gelatinous cuts of meat. So when we have a deficiency, uh, imagine trying to build a house with a deficiency of mortar. You'd have bricks, but you have nothing filling in the gaps. So when we supply those amino acids, the body has the raw materials to reassemble what it needs in order to create that barrier function. So that's one reason why they're so healing. The second aspect is they have a low allergenicity. So we're much more attuned to be tolerant to the amino acids from things like animals than we are, say, plants uh, and seeds because humans have been more biologically engineered to derive their proteins from those sources. So they supply the raw materials for the body to resynthesize and rebuild the cells that they need to keep the barrier sealed. Is the process of cooking a broth, though, also sort of a kind of pre-digestion, right? In a way, yeah. uh, the protein is less, com is less complexly folded. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have a, a muscle protein that's a long string of amino acids. There just might be less amino acids to break down in a broth protein. Do you have a website, please? I d uh, well, the website you can look at anything I do is uh, healthoptimizationmedicine.org. It's the homepage for what myself, Dr. Ted, and uh, the group of health optimization practitioners do. Uh, but my own website, no, I'm a little bit of an internet ghost. I don't even have social media, which is weird for someone my age. <laughs> All right, let's give one more thank you to a roll of